I'm not, I'm not going to keep this short because we have till 5.30. And first of all, I'd just like to thank um, our guests. And first of all, welcome our guests to Sheridan College. Uh, and thank you very much for allowing us to see the, have a preview of um, an American tale. And uh, I'd just like you to give a thanks to our guests and to introduce them. Our South uh, University people, Barry Carman, who is director of uh, publicity and advertising, and uh, Karen Keith, who's a publicity um, promoter from Universal. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and it goes without saying a very big thanks to Don Bluth and. Uh, a big hand and welcome for our very special guest. This is a nice warm room, I can tell that. Uh, it's warm in many ways. It's a pleasure to be here and to talk to you and to share some of the things that, that I feel. Some of the things that probably we're all feeling together when it comes to the, the world of animation and how we're going to get it to grow, or if it's just going to die and we're going to watch it sink into the Lombrea tar pit, or what is going to happen to it. Uh, it's a delicate balance, I think, between economics and art, and we have to know how to balance that. And if you don't balance it correctly, then the thing falls over. And. Um, let me, tar let me tell you an anecdote, which it illustrates very well. Um, this is a joke which deals with a little man that came to the Pope. And he said to the Pope, I represent the cheese people. And he says, when you say the Lord's Prayer from now on, I would like you to say, give us this day our daily bread and cheese. You heard this joke? <laughs> and the Pope says, well, I can't do that. Absolutely impossible, can't do that. He says, I am prepared to offer you $3 million if you will do that. And he says, no, I can't. He says, will you if I give you $6 million? He says, no, can't do that. He says, all right, what about if I give you $12 million? Will you just add and cheese? And he says, no, I won't. So the little man took his portfolio, left the place, disappeared, and as he left, the Pope turned to the little man next to him. He says, how much do we get from the bread people? <laughs> <laughs> so, there is this reality that we have to deal with, you know, that is can itself. And it has a lot to do with, you know, what you make, what you put on the screen. One of the analogies that I like to draw, and I think this is very important, is every one of you who is involved in animation, if you are, um, has a particular taste that you like. You may like classical style animation. You may like uh, UPA animation. You may like your own style of animation. You may like to take sand and rub it with paint and animate that. You may like anything. It varies as many people are in this room that's how many different styles and likes and dislikes we have. So how do you market it? You know, is there a place for what you like? That's basically the question that we've got to answer. Um, so let me address that just a little bit. How do you get what you do to make somebody wanted enough to put some money on the table and say, do it for me? And then how do you actually put your heart into it and say, I want to do it and I'm doing it for the art of it. I love doing it. So it's this balance I'm talking about. If we were to speak about music today, and I said, let's talk about music, you would immediately know, because it's already been established in your head, that there are many different kinds of music. There's classical music, jazz music, there is jazz, there is reggae music, there is, help me. <laughs> Rock. New Wave. What? New Wave. New wave. Okay. Country. Country. Folk. Pop. <laughs> I mean, there's how many kinds of music can you really name? Lots. But it's all called music. Now, I'm going to say the word animation. Is it all the same? 
Mm -mm. What are the categories? Yeah. Did someone forget <laughs> to give us categories so that we don't even know what we're talking about? Nine blind men trying to describe an elephant? <laughs> An elephant is a snake, an elephant is a wall, an elephant is a <laughs> That seems to be kind of where we are, so that we really don't know what we're talking about when we say animation, and so we all get in a room and we start jangling with each other, arguing about what it is. You're wrong. This is what's good. Which does you no good at all. Very interesting thing. This is learning a little bit from history, but Steven Spielberg is about to do a picture which, with uh, Richard Williams. And uh, it's a picture that's a combination picture. It's a thing called Who Shot Roger Rabbit? And um, he said, he's always loved animation, so he said, what I, what I did is I got all the old animators that I could find, Chuck Jones, Frizz Freeling, he got them all, they put them in a room, and he said, let's have a story meeting. And what he really did is he got nitroglycerin and he put it all in a room. <laughs> And he said, he said, I have never seen such hatred in my entire life. <laughs> when I got all of those men who had worked together in the past and put them in a room, he said, because they were carrying grudges. He says, Hollywood has nothing on the animation industry. <laughs> nothing. He said, these people are actually hating each other, jealous of each other, angry at each other, holding a grudge that they won't let go of for love or money. And he said, I never would have thought that. Now, what in the world do you suppose caused that? Some kind of unrequited appreciation that was somebody's not applauding where they needed it. Someone didn't take them and love them and say, thank you for what you gave. You know, it was terrific. Thank you. You know, somewhere someone needs to, besides the dollar, you know, needs to hug you and say, thank you. And I guess maybe that was it. And then some of them are bitter because they left Disney Studio for whatever reason, because they had many of them worked there, and sailed away into TV land. And after they got into TV land, it wasn't what they thought, and they were too proud to go back. And uh, they sort of sat the rest of their life out there, hating it and hating what they did. You know, and thus hating themselves. So it didn't work. It didn't work very well. Can you hear me clear up there? Okay, good. I don't like that. <laughs> um, so anyway, I think we can't let that happen. What has, to ha what has to happen for everybody that's in this industry that wants to make it work is you have to find out what you do well and then do it so well that somebody will run and say, come here, watch, and bring it back and say, do it again. That's the key to success. Do what you do so well that someone will ask you to do it again after they've brought a friend back. And then, you know, you see you're getting into uh, demand market. So that's what we have to do. Now, I think uh, what I'd like to address now is these different styles of animation and when you should use a style. If I want you to sit in these chairs for two hours you know, it really hurts to sit for two hours. It hurts to sit for even five minutes. And it hurts me more than most people because I don't have anything to sit on. And so, I'm, I'm very thin. <laughs> Work as I will and eat as I will, it does nothing happen. So, so there's no weight there. But to sit in a chair for an hour and a half and watch a movie, an audience has got to have something more than graphics. Now remember that, and I'm going to call that kind of animation classical animation, just for fun, just for now. We'll call it classical because we don't want your graphics to show. I don't want to know that you drew it. I don't want to know that you paint brushed it. I don't want to know. I want to hide the artist in the wings. I want it to seem like it's real, seem like it's just romantic, it just happened, and nobody did it. It's there. Why? The reason why is because I want that hour and a half, I want you to sit in the chair and focus on something besides graphics. And the only thing I can think of here is a story, a plot, a point of view, a character on screen that's so fantastic that you identify with it. 
that you want to you want to know about it. It creates a, a curiosity in you. There's something about it that you know it's the character you're after. You know the hell with how he's drawn. You don't want to know he's drawn. You want to think he's there and he's alive. The word to animate means to give life, to quicken, to imbue with, with qualities of life. Remember that. That's what to animate means. The word cartoon, and this is not to put it down, but cartoon means to exaggerate, to caricature, to go far beyond, to reach into the world of silliness. You know, an illustrator oversimplifies something to the point of where, you know, you can put across the point, like political statements. If you, want a, if you want something to see a political idea that you have, you draw a political cartoon. And you're gonna make it a cartoon because you want someone to look at it and go, ah, isn't that funny? Just like that, because it's oversimplified, it's exaggerated. So that helps you quite a bit. Now, but you can look at a political cartoon in how long? One minute, half a second. You can see it like that. Nobody has to sit in a chair. You know, you can just see it. But if I said, sit in the chair and look at the political cartoon for two hours. <laughs> you know, you can't. You can't. So, we have one category over here, which I'll call classical animation. Hide the artist. Use a style which hides him. Use a style which is semi-realistic, but not really realistic. It's romantic realism. Make it beautiful. Make it tintillating. Make the artist, make the audience bathe in that experience. Make them just enjoy it. And it gets into, before I leave this category, it gets into something much grander. It gets into theater. And theater is probably one of the most magical things that we have. And you're probably all in the wrong classes learning to draw. You should be over in the theater department. That's where you would pick up a lot of what you need to do classical animation. Now, what theater does so well, and the Greeks were good at this. The Greeks said, we'll write these tragedies. And then we'll play them before our people. And the Greek tragedies were like a valve on the society. What they did is, the Greeks who were so troubled with all of their things about living would crowd into their seats and watch these tragedies. And as they did, somehow they would identify with the actors, providing the actors are good. They would identify with them. When that identification takes place, whether you like the, the actor or the part or not, when the identification takes place, there's a thing that happens called catharsis. Million dollar word which means what? Involvement. Involvement is good. But it's more. Good. Release of emotions. It's a house cleaning. Cleans you up. And anything that you might have inside that is clogged up, hatred for somebody, rage, envy, jealousy, you know, all those things that, you know, you don't need. I mean, you, don't want to, you can't fly with that stuff weighting you down. Well, what it does is it goes in and pulls it out, releases it. And you're just sitting there in your seat, you know, watching this happen, and it's like magic. It pulls it out of you. That's called catharsis, and it comes through theater. And why aren't we using that in animation? If you did, then the audience would start looking at the animation. They wouldn't see mice, they wouldn't see goats, they wouldn't see whatever you're drawing up there. They identify with the characters, they get a catharsis for that, they love what they just felt, and that feeling that they just felt then says, hold it just a minute. Go over here, look. Now do that again for my friend. See, and then, economically, where does this lead you? They're gonna buy a ticket. And when they buy a ticket, that means there'll be another ticket. And you quite possibly will have a chance to make a boffo. And if you make a boffo, then you're in business. And if you're in business, you can go on a picnic. <laughs> and not back to school to learn another profession. So, I think it's really important to understand that animation needs first to realize that it should be this kind of animation, classical animation, 
hour and a half sitting on your rump. That needs to be theater. All right? Now, as we go down in time, I want someone to sit in their chair for a half an hour. So if it's only a half an hour, that's not asking too much. Half an hour, please. You know, you can do that. At least there, I've got to give them a concept. Maybe it's something like, you know, who pushes the button that blows up the world. Just give them a concept so that they're riveted to at least a concept. And you see two funny little, um, did I see one called the spider recently? Someone, it was a little janitor and a spider and he chases the spider all over the place and he's trying to kill the spider and finally, he's very frustrated, cannot kill the spider, but he finally kills the spider. The spider gets under a, a little cup and the cup goes over the top of this thing. He pulls the cup off and kills it. When you do, you pull back and you see seven or eight television screens and these rockets are taking off. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so it has this surprise at the end that kind of thrills you. But you have a concept that you're putting across, and that little piece right there is only, I think, uh, nine, ten minutes long. But it kept you, inter <laughs> kept, you <entertained. laughs> kept you entertained long enough to where you could let the style of that be very modernistic. And it was. It was done in a very angular style, and big, broad lines. And I mean, I saw the artist everywhere in there. He was just screaming, look, 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 look. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a certain amount of self-indulgence, you know, or ego, if you want to have it, uh, that is in those pieces. And when you get to get, when you are performing as an animator, your ego is just huge. Everybody in this room has an ego that is huge. And ego is tremendously important to your role as an artist. You need an ego to do this. But you need to be in control of your ego. And you need to know when it's time to team with your other egos. You know, I love the story of when they did um, We Are the World, We Are the Children. You know, and, and when, um, oh, what's his name? Michael. Michael Jones. Quincy Jones? No, the one who produced it. Quincy Jones. Quincy Jones. Quincy Jones. Quincy Jones, thank you. Quincy Jones says, all right, all you guys, leave your egos at the door. And come on in here and we'll do this song. Not for yourselves, but we'll do it for the world. Leave your egos at the door or you stay outside the door. And so they came in and they did the song. And it went relatively smooth, relatively, I say, because some egos just are too big to fit through a door. <laughs> so, learn that. Learn that there's a time for even E. Sock Perlman to go to the symphony orchestra. Maybe he can play first chair. Maybe he has to play second chair, but he has to team sometimes. And teaming, some, sometimes the job is just too big. So teaming has to be part of it. And if you can learn to team, then, you know, it's a joy. You can joy with the people you work with. Now, I, ca I came here to Sheridan, and let me, let me say one of the reasons I wanted to come here. I requested this. And I did it because we have seven people at home who actually helped make American Tale who are from Sheridan. Who, uh, who are from here and are very good. You know, and I hunt all over for schools that have animation curriculums who can train people and get them to perform. And it's amazing how the people that come from here, they've been very, very good. Their portfolios are strong. And uh, as I said, as I came up here today, whatever you're doing here, you're doing something correctly. You're learning how to draw. You're learning how to animate. You're learning what it means to be an animator. Um, I only know of one other school that we usually get a lot of portfolios from, and that's CalArts. Um, plus that, and I don't say this to flatter you, so many of the people that we've gotten down there are nice people, which bothers me. I mean, I don't know why they're nice. <laughs> I'm used to dealing with California people who, um, in many ways, are the total filmmaker. I mean, they have their camera, they have their edit equipment, they have the movie all the time. <laughs> and they're going to make the entire film and they don't need anyone. <laughs> so if you ask them to do some job, like sweep the floor, <laughs> they can't do it. 
They never, they forgot the broom, they wouldn't use the broom if you give them one. So it, it isn't a thing where you can depend on those people to be there beside you, you know, helping get things to happen. But that's not the case of the seven people that came from here. Those seven little dwarfs have been really... <laughs> <laughs> They've been just really, really terrific. And uh, so I thought, while I'm up here in Toronto, it'd be nice to come here and tell you that your program's terrific, your teachers are doing something fine. Support them. They're doing something good. <laughs> the other thing that probably, as we're saying, is that, um, has to do with, how do I say it? <laughs> it has to do with any teacher that tries to teach you the language of animation. And the language of animation is what? Do you know? I mean, let me give it, let me give it to you a little simpler. That's a very hard question. What, if, if I was going to become an eloquent writer, what is my language? Communication. Words. A writer. What is my language? It's words. Uh, if I'm going to become an excellent animator, what is my language? Words. Drawing. Drawing. Drawing should be as automatic to you as breathing. You can't express an idea while you're worried about how to draw. And a lot of times when you sit down and you try to then talk about drawing, you know, and you try to get an idea, the content of what you're trying to say, you try to get that on a piece of paper, you must worry about the content. If you are eternally worrying about how to hold your pencil or how to get the pencil to work for you or what weight of pencil it is or whether or not the proportions are right or does the anatomy work, gee, you can't even do it. If I had to battle with all of that while I was doing story sketches, it would be so hard I would never get through it. <coughs> but what works very nicely is if I can just put the automatic switch in the subconscious, turn it on, and say, I know how to draw the mouse, okay? I know I can draw him from every angle. You just throw me an angle, I can draw the mouse. Because I've practiced that, I know that. Now, what does the mouse want to say? So I can get into that. That's the most important thing. So you have to get your language down. There's a technique that you need to know. Techniques are all over the place. You know, all the tools that you could possibly use. Know what those are and surround yourself with the appropriate tools. Without the tools, it will you'll fight yourself. You won't get as much to happen. <coughs> And then there's another thing that if I were an animator, let me go back over here to this category again. If I were an animator and I wanted to entertain in this category, in classical, I would study acting. I would come to understand what acting is. Um, we just have employed a new program at the studio. And your seven people are in it. And that is we got an acting coach to come in and start teaching all of us to act. And we made it mandatory for all the animators to go to this, this class, this series of classes. And so they get in there, and the acting coach says, first of all, okay, one person at a time, I want you to stand up here. He says, I want you to drop your mask, and I want you to bring up an emotion of when you felt very sad. And let us see it. Well, it's very hard to do. You know, you spend most of your life putting that mask on so no one can see what you really feel, what you really think. Heaven forbid that anyone thought that you had a feeling. Guys, particularly, will not let their feeling down. They go home, they shut the door, they cry their eyes in <laughs> there's a knock at the door, wow, those eyes dry right up. <laughs> maybe sometime, maybe someone will see that tear, but not very often. And they have to maintain this super, super strong, strong matcha thing. But you guys go home and look in the mirror. You're not that strong. You're really not. So what you do, and watch this too. The guys who cry the most are in the weight room. <laughs> <laughs> they've got to make sure. They've got to make sure that you can't see through the mask. Okay? So they 
Methinks thou dost protest too much, remember? <laughs> so what happens is you've got it, and who are they really trying to help? I mean, I'm the one who's in the weight room all the time. I mean, this is pathetic to see, but I'm, in there. I'm trying to lift these stupid weights that with an idiot, you know. <laughs> but trying to convince myself that I'm also a part of the male part of this human race, and therefore I'm okay, and uh, I'll, I'll survive this, even, even though I have these feelings. I can't show those feelings. I can't do that. Well, what the drama coach has caused us to do is in a group, he's caused us to relax given us relaxation exercises, which I started using in animation. And I, nobody will be able to see this, but <clears throat> sit in a chair, and you just extend your feet, and start with your feet, and just get them to relax. Think about it. <clears throat> Work all up your body like this, relaxing it. Let your arms hang, relax those. Let your neck and your back <laughs> Get the whole thing to relax, right? Maybe you even go over like this and relax. <laughs> and as soon as you get everything to relax, and let that happen, you'll find that thoughts will start to flow. Then you can do your emotional recalls. Now in the area of classical animation, if you are going to depict a character who is feeling, we'll say, sad, Feifel Moskowitz that you saw this morning, okay, he feels bad because he's lost his father, and he's so discouraged and so despaired that he says, I'll never find him again. And they don't care anyway. And if they did care, they'd find me. I don't care if I ever see them again. It's a combination of anger and despair. Now, if I just simply indicated that emotion by putting those expressions on that character's face, I don't think it would work very well. So what I have to do is I have to go inside, find those emotions. They're back in there. I've lived them. Find them and then get quiet, bring them up inside, bring them right to the point where I want to verbalize them. Usually despair and pain, you don't even need words to verbalize. Do you know what you do when you're in pain? You moan. <laughs> and if I, were, if I were to do this, if you're in a room alone, of course, you won't do this with anyone else around, but if you're in a room alone and you bring this up and you suddenly feel it, you'd go, ah, you'd start doing that and you'd moan. All right, in this acting class, that's what's happened. Ralph Zondag. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Ralph Zondag. In fact, the two Zondag twins, the, the two brothers, <laughs> I have to tell you that I've never seen wetter armpits. <laughs> this is the hardest thing for anyone to do. Well, they would get up, and they want to do it so badly because they're trying so hard to let out something that has been trapped inside of you. Something that is, is trapped inside of you, let me tell you for sure, it's there and it's trapped and it wants out. And so you, what you have to do is you have to let that mask down, let the tears out, let the anguish out, and be able to let these emotions flow out. Acting does that. My wife's like a catharsis, you know, in reverse. You, the actor, get something. <coughs> So, in doing this, what's happened to our animators is that they are able now to go back to the scene and say, now I know the feeling. I just relived it. I remember it. Now I'm going to go put it on the character of Fievel. And so then you draw that, trying to express that. That's why you might look in the mirror and you might find out what it feels like. And it's very strange, but did you know when, when this method of acting is employed, you don't even have to say, move your hand over here or move your face this way in a certain line. You'll find that every action that you do will just flow out naturally because you have a feeling of that emotion. So it's a good thing to understand the acting. And we're doing a lot more of it right now to help the animators grow so that they aren't just graphic in their orientation. They're also oriented in acting. There's one other area they need. Music has those many faces that we described, but being able to count music, the, the, uh, the picture that we're working on right now is another one for Steven Spielberg and George Lucas, two problems. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, this picture, we have not had the convenience of having all the voices recorded. So 
Chuck said, well, the only alternative I can do is pick temporary music, and we'll animate to temporary music, and it'll probably look something like Fantasia. And so what we'll do is we'll do it that way. And so then I had to write out the music, give them a copy of the music with the measures numbered and where I'm calling out the measures on the cassette tape, give them a piece of the music with the measures numbered, and said, now you listen to it, just listen to it, look at it, and animate to beats of music. Do you all know music? Mm -hmm. How many do know music? That's pretty good. That's pretty good. I would expect it. Share in college. <laughs> it's very good. Well, anyway, it's, it's a tool that is very necessary to you. Music fills all of your existence. You know that, don't you? I mean, it's everywhere. It runs the universe. And uh, it's in everything. Rhythm. Rhythm is everywhere. Slows against the fasts. The staccato against the legato. It's everywhere. So learn to hear and to see it. This music is something that will influence your work. So you're not just visual. You're visual, you're audio, you're spiritual. You're all of those things put together that channels itself through what we call animation. So as long as, as you're going to be that, then gain an understanding of as many facets of it as you can so you can manifest it well. Okay, we need to go down the line and talk about some of the other categories of animation. TV commercials. Those are, those are dictated pretty much by the client. And so you're going to get into almost any style there. The one thing you will know about a television commercial is that you must please the client and it must sell whatever he is marketing. <coughs> And so you won't be entirely free. Your hands will be somewhat tied. It won't be just a trip through the park. You're going to do a lot of phoning and a lot of talking to the middlemen between you and the client. And they're going to want it just perfect. And everybody's going to be trembling because they're going to lose their job. So what you have to do somehow is you have to get this television commercial to look really, really good according to whoever the agency might be. But it's not as creative, but it's very rewarding, and you can earn a terrific living doing that. So there's something for you there. Uh, we're starting up a television commercial division at the studio, because we think it's a place to train people. I think it's a place that, uh, you know, you can find some hope that you have a future. What this all boils down to is that unless we can find money to put in your pockets to raise your families, there's no future in what we're doing. So we have to, again, balance economics with your aesthetic thirst. And that's what we're trying to do. Okay. Um, what I'd like to do is maybe give you a little bit of time and let you ask some questions, because I know you might have some at this point. And that will lead me in directions that could possibly give us some interesting conversation. Okay? And if you don't mind, I would like to take off my coat. <laughs> Yes. I was wondering, can you can you read and write music? Yes. Okay. okay. But that happened because of an overpowering malicious mother. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that's why. Yes. Um, why did why did you continue in American Tale? Why did you continue after the fire on the pier? Wouldn't it have been a bit better to end there as opposed to the next? Oh. Yes, yes, you're right. <laughs> there are certain things in life that one must do, okay? And the reason that we continued after that, and the story was really over at that point. The reason we did it is because Steven Spielberg wanted a fire at the end of the movie. And it was really as simple as that. Uh, we reasoned with him. <laughs> he said, I would like you know, to go through that additional emotional whatever it is. He said, and I want to feel the imagery of the fire at the warehouse. Now, that was an idea that was in the original David Kirshner concept of the script. It was a carryover that we never got rid of. So it just stayed in the script, and we were never able to actually flush it out. So there it is. There's more, by the way, if you want to look for it. <laughs> yeah. Well, 
There's an abrupt transition there, is that what you're talking about? <laughs> <laughs> right off time money. <laughs> There was just no more time. <laughs> In fact, some of the scenes we were sh we were shooting them two, three, four times, and we were trying. We had a cutoff date that said you have to be done by this date. Give us the negative; it has to be cut. Uh, and we had still 400 feet that we had to be had to be shot. Many of the scenes were shot over and over and over. We have scenes all through the picture that have some mistakes in, and we never got the mistakes out. So we didn't have time to you know go back and shoot them. Eight times through, and that's it. You don't get shooting anymore. But that's a very good find. I, I'm glad that you're picking on the positive points. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Yes, sir. Um, how much did Steven Spielberg have to do with the film as far as, like, uh, storyboard and character? Uh, let's see. Steven is a, he's a very wise man, and I think he has a lot of vision. His ideas are very visual. But he also knew that if he suffocated, that we probably wouldn't get the best thing. And I was very delighted to know that what he did, he said, make a good picture, uh, bring around what you do, show me, and uh, then let's take it from there. So he put a lot of ideas into the hopper after we'd gone through the storyboards. He okayed the storyboards, and then he would say, oh, this is great, I love it, 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 I love it. and he said, but right here, <laughs> you know, then he would... I'll give you an example. Uh, where the little boy is, is going upon deck, you know. As he was going upon deck, what I had originally boarded and what was written is that the wind came through those doors, grabbed his hat, blew it up on deck, and so it was quite an accident that happened. Steve said, no, 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 no. Have the kid take his hat off and throw it up there. <laughs> now, you see, that's a really big change. Because it means that that little brat got what was coming. <laughs> it wasn't a happy accident. That wasn't, a, you know, no wind or accident got him. But he threw his hat up there and then said, Papa, I got to get my hat. And then he went right up on the So that makes it a much different thing. And it makes the audience go, What are you, why, you little shit? <laughs> Thing. You know, he has the judgment to just pinpoint that and say, that's better entertainment. So th that's where he's... Uh, which would you rather have done yourself? The wind or the, or the way he wanted it to do? The way he wanted was better. It was. It made more sense to me because the wind would have been, it would have made Fievel a victim. And what needs to happen that early in the picture is that Fievel needed to make the choice, therefore being a naughty boy. And so the little children in the audience will say, oh, he was naughty. And then later on, they learn the consequences of being naughty. You know, and that after he goes through all of this mess, the city beats upon him, then he gets rescued. You know, so it really teaches a better lesson. I just noticed that you said that the little kids would know something. Was this film directed for, or like, towards children? No, no. No, it's actually layered. So the film is directed towards, you know, many ages. There's lots of things that go just to the wit of the adults. The historical part of it, I think, has a lot to do with uh, American history and goes to those people who are very, right now, um, nostalgic about their roots. You know, and are turning back to their genealogy and thinking where they came from. Like, when I first heard this story, uh, my great-great-grandparents, in 1880, they came over from um, Norway and Sweden. Okay, so they came out of that area and went through Castle Garden and went through all of this mess where they got sold into sweatshops and everything. So it's sort of a familiar chord inside of me. But at the same time, um, there are things that are just for the children. Now, making a movie, a classical movie, that people will watch as a piece of theater, what must happen is all ages have to be able to sit through it. You don't want an adult to sit there and watch My Little Pony and go, well, with this <laughs> You can't do this. You know, to be adult,
adult. The other thing is the adult will drop the child off and say, I'll see you later, I'll come back and get you. That's even worse. Because an animated film needs to be a joy, a thing that's going to stick in your memory that you'll always remember. And what do you want to remember with it is that if there was mom, there was dad, and they were sitting next to you, and when the big bad wolf began to growl, you could, you know, hang on to them. And you want to remember that. Do you not remember Bambi? Would you not go back with your own children? Mm -hmm. Isn't that indelible in your head? When the mother said, Bambi, quick the thicket, don't you remember that? Can you get it out of your head? And where she's saying, faster, faster, faster. You know when he's saying, we made it, mother, we made it, mother. Isn't that in your brain? Was that made for children? Yes and no. When I watch that, what I'm actually seeing is I am seeing a prelude to what is coming. Someday my mother's going to die. See, and then I'm, I'm seeing what it's like to suddenly be confronted with death and have to deal with that. So there's a lot taught through symbolic language, I think, that's for the children. And there's another reality that's taught strictly for the adults. So it's not one or the other. Oh. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think we have to give that to Dom DeLuise. Uh, Dom DeLuise is one where he's, he's a terrifically wonderful guy. And what happens is I don't like to stop the creative process when someone's written a script. So generally when we get the voice talent, we take the voices like Dom. I said, Dom, here's the script. You can read it. Here's what the character looks like. And I showed him the drawing. And he said, too fat, too fat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on, it's gotta be fat. So this is the way the cat is. And he said, all right, all right. And I said, uh. <laughs> he said, let me, let me think about it. And as he began to read the script, suddenly ideas began to come to his mind that the writers never thought of. And he just took off in his own direction, you know, and ad-libbed through much of it and came up with, you know, all the stuff where he says, oh, I thought, I, I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's dumb. It wasn't in the script. In Secret of Mim, he had a little expression that was, um, oh, excuse me, pardon me, excuse me, pardon me. <laughs> he and his kids do that around the house, but it wasn't in the script. <laughs> so he then amplifies what was written. And uh, Dom DeLuise, I think in the middle of all of this, suddenly got cowardly lionitis or something, and he started adding that in there. And, and he stopped at one point, he says, I sound like Bert Locke. Am I wrong? Should I be doing this? <laughs> and I, I told him, I said, no, not at all. I said, let it go. So he went on in that direction, so if there's anyone to blame, it's me. <laughs> Could stop that. Yeah. Can you explain a little bit of the, of the process that you went through from... The time it was, the book was written by somebody. Was this a book no. that existed? It was a script that was written. No, it was a script. Okay. From from the process of even script writing, what happens around that area? Characters get designed that change the story, or uh, storyboarding yes. sequences change the story. How okay. does there is a ping pong that goes on. The uh, the script is really first of all you write a synopsis. And then everyone reads the synopsis and they either, you know, salute or they say, no good, try again. And if they like it at some point, then everyone at Amblin or Steven Spielberg's people say, we like, and everybody at our people says, we like, and it has potential, then we go to the next stage, you know, and we write the treatment, which is a little more amplified with a little bit of dialogue in it. And then if everyone likes, then we go to the script. As you write the script, little things start to happen. And that is your, your vision starts to increase and you begin to see other potentially entertaining ideas. And as those ideas come into play, you say, darn, I wish we thought of that. Can't we change the script? Well, sure you do. So you go back in there and begin to pull out little things in the script and insert new ideas. And uh, it makes it good. An example. We originally had warranty rat as a rat. And then we thought, no. That's sort of boring, he's a rat, so what? What if he were part of the cats? And he actually wore a rat's disguise, and what he was selling was protection. That makes it more fun, gives it a couple of layers. So we wrote that in. And we said, if he's, if he's a member of the Mott Street Maulers, all the cats, that, we need to give him something that, you know, so that he's fun. And what would that be? 
he likes to quote Shakespeare. He thinks he's a tremendous actor, and he's the worst. So he's a bad actor. And he thinks he's a great musician, and he's the worst. So that we give him some layers there. And he has no idea. That's what makes him kind of funny, is that he has no idea of what he really looks like to everybody else. He thinks he's great. And then the other afterthought was this little cockroach. Uh, that was great. I mean, that was just, it wasn't in the script. And we said, how can he walk around? Who's he going to talk to? How can he go, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. You've you got to give him something to talk to. So it was Judy Freudberg that said, how about a cockroach? And so we said, cockroach, that's appealing, OK. <laughs> we kicked the idea around quite a bit and said, what does the cockroach do? He counts warranties money. Oh, well, then he's a pocket calculator. He lives in his pocket. What should we call a pocket calculator? Oh, we can call him a uh, fidget. We can call him no, a digit. Digit for the digits on a kind of pocket calculator. So you come up with all these ideas and start putting them in there. When we knew he was a pocket calculator and everything, that meant he had to have a big brain. So his forehead went up. <laughs> you know, and he began to look more like a Frankenstein with this big forehead. And then, when we got those big antenna, the next thing that happened is, what do you do with antenna that is shaped like that? Now that you've said the word Frankenstein? <laughs> so, you know, one idea just sort of gives birth to another idea, but you're hoping not to nail the script down so that you can't let that birth happen. Because you want to let that happen as best you can. Creative process is really important. It's a process, realize that. And the more that you edit yourself and say, well, I don't want to use that idea. I, I don't want to use that idea. I'm going to leave this one out, too. Don't do that. Put them all on the table. Tomorrow morning after eating your breakfast, you'll feel better. <laughs> Put them on the table. And look at them later in the light of day. You'll find all kinds of ideas that will just be terrific, really good. So don't edit yourself ever in the moment that you're doing that. Do you remember that awful period in your life when you had to go through freshman English. Anyone remember that? <laughs> None of you went through it. <laughs> when you had to write, you know, those term papers, and you had to write one a week, I did, and you write one a week and you say everything. By the end of the freshman year, you have emptied your insides. You have nothing left to say. And what the one thing they taught me was write down on a piece of paper everything you thought what you were going to write about. You know, I'm going to write about uh, the sex life of buffaloes in South Africa. Okay. <laughs> I write down on this piece of paper everything I think probably pertains to that. You know, what do the hooves do? <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter what order. Just write it all down. Later, what you're going to do is organize it into such a way that it makes some sense. You may decide to eliminate some ideas. Put it all down first. Uh, you do the same thing when you start off animating your scene. Before you start drawing, write notes. You've done your emotional recall. You begin to feel things. You analyze what the feelings are. You write out notes. One, two, three. Write out notes of what you think should be in this scene and why it will be entertaining. And why would anyone want to watch it besides your mom? <laughs> when you start doing it, isn't this going to limit your time? Like getting all, the, all these ideas, but like you say, it's a run out of time. I mean, you know, the more ideas you have, the more work you have to do, and then you're going to run out of time. Yeah, you do. You run out of time. But uh, again, it's a balancing act, and you do have to figure out at some point to say, I have till this day to really make up my mind and just take as much time as you can to get there. If you run out of time and money, then you have Bible flying up in the air when you should have made a better transition. <laughs> so that, we, that does happen, but try and budget your time. Don't just save it all to the end. Try and say, I want to get things done by certain points along the way. That'll help you a lot. Yes, this gentleman? Uh, the horoscope is distracting. When, uh, other than money purposes, when you decide to shoot a horoscope and uh, how can this actually help us? Horoscope. Uh, horoscope has many definitions, and if you rotoscope by just simply tracing, you know, and you use that tracing, it's usually flat, it's weightless, 
and it, it isn't very entertaining. It begins to look like you want to tear it away and look at the actor behind it. Um, but there is one reason. We used it a lot in American Tale. But we didn't want characters that were people. Notice that none of the people had any personality. We just sort of went past them and went down to the mice. And I think it's because if there's anything that our eyes are trained to see, it's other people. And we know, subconsciously, we know what people move like. And we know when it's a lie. If you move a person wrong, you say, that isn't what people move like, you know. <laughs> so you immediately spot a lie in the movement because we are people and we know how people move. Now, we don't know how mice move. We don't know how goats move. We don't know how dogs move exactly because we're not dogs, goats, and mice. So the, the best way to get around this is uh, start with people. They're filled with subtlety of movement, so you rotoscope them to help you get there as close as you can. Because if you're too far off, someone's going to say, lie, 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 lie. But if you use it just simply all the time, it has no life. And you really haven't done anything but copy. You know? So it has to be something that's further beyond. Yeah. Speaking of copying, I noticed you're using a process called xerography. Yes. Um, that's new. I was kind of wondering what the, the basics are behind it. It's a It's used in 101 Dalmatians. Yes. It's been used for many, many years now. And um, they used it because it actually cuts costs. You know, instead of inking the cells, what they do is Xerox them onto the plastic. And you can get a very beautiful effect if you have, we have something like uh, nine different Xerox colors. So we can go all the way from black down to these very subtle shades of gray, and you can make the characters look extremely soft because you can get the gray lines. And it's very accurate. So as accurate as you want to make your cleanup drawings, that's how accurate the cells will be. It's a great, it's a great process. I like it better than inky, actually. So it's been used for a while. Back there. Uh, I think the uh, secret of Nymphs compared uh, to the this one and in terms of cost, production values, et cetera. You know what? <clears throat> Secret and M cost six, three, this cost nine, and I have no objectivity as far as the way it looks. I don't know whether it looks better or, or what. I know, I think the story is stronger. It's my opinion. And I think we've learned a little bit about animation, but I'm not sure, because I can't see it. And probably I won't be able to see this picture for maybe another five years. I, I, I'm too subjective, yeah. All I can see is who did it and what a mess it was and how we tried to cover up the mess. <laughs> when you get bad animation, what your director does is he puts overlays in front of it. That's how you know. <laughs> overlays, fog. Yeah. <laughs> real losers, yeah. Could you give us a little bit of a history of uh, your studio? History? In days? Yeah, uh, our sir. Our studio started, of course, you know, with the exodus from Disney Studio, and I'm very bad at dates, but it happened in 1980. And uh, we left there over a basic aesthetic difference of opinion. Um, I've always felt very strongly that art, art is a great human product. It's something that we humans do very well. And it has to do with our viewpoint of nature, what you think about the world you're living in. You know, do you love where you are? Do you love riding a horse? Do you love having children? Do you love uh, eating? Do you love going to the theater? I mean, what, what do you think? <coughs> what do you feel? And artwork is this moment in which you say, this is what I feel. And I want everybody to look at it and see how I feel. Do you feel that way? See, so it's, it's a way of asking or, or giving to someone. And it's done by looking at nature. Well, what happened when I was at Disney Studio, and it took me almost 10 years to spot this, I was very slow, uh, is that we were making pictures there, and I loved being an animator, you know, and saying to all of my relatives that I worked at Disney Studio. <laughs> because you can get off on that little trip. But uh, I loved saying that, but at the same time, I noticed that each picture we were making was a reflection of some previous picture that we began to be very image conscious as a corporation, and that we were actually serving the image 
so that the corporation could make the money. And I believe in balance. That's terrific. You know, to balance this out. But that got beyond my definition of what art was. Instead of looking to nature, taking risks, and finding the inspiration in the world, we were finding it in past conquest. So that became the bone of contention. And I began to argue, and there were others besides myself that did this. And we were making life unhappy for them and for ourselves. So we said, we'll go away, you stay here, sure sandbox, and we'll find another place where we can play. <laughs> and then, as we play over there, and you play over here, we'll be in sort of a competitive thing, we'll put it on the screen and we'll see who's right. Which, which I think has caused them to bounce back a little bit and to recuperate and to make a better product. I was very proud of Mouse Detective. I thought they did a pretty darn good job. And it was something where, you know, they got out there, they rallied, they said, we're going to do this. <laughs> and I heard, you know, because they're very close to us, we can throw rocks across the street. <laughs> I, I heard, you know, via the grapevine and everything, they say, that damn Don Bluth, we're going to get him this time with this picture. It's going to work. And I thought, terrific. Good. Make him mad enough to where at least they'll come out fighting. So it was a good thing that we learned. And as the history goes, I mean, I knew we were sailing away from the Queen Mary in a dinghy in the fog, so that we could very well drown. And there were 17 of us, and as we did this, and we went out there, we made secret of them, and after we made secret of them, we said, well, now what? And we were all out of business. There was no picture coming. Secret of them did not make the money we needed. Secret of them did not even recoup its money. I didn't plan on that. I thought the whole world was going to be the path to the door. And so we were nearly out of business when we started into the arcade games, and we made Dragon's Lair, we made Space Ace. They were very successful. And then the arcade market fell apart, and nobody wanted laser discs. So then we were down again, and we tried like mad to keep our people together, like you would try to keep a ballet corps together, you know, so they wouldn't fall away somewhere else. And we put a lot of our own money into paying their salaries. It took us deeper into debt. And as we did that, finally, um, we went down so far that we had $6,000 in our bank account, and it looked like we were going to close. And that was when the phone call came from Stephen. And he said, how would you like to do American Tale? And I said, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> what capture? <laughs> So anyway, we went over and talked to him, and I acted very casual as if I was making a decision. Because <laughs> the weather, you know, we really wanted to do this picture, and he said, but it's not a mouse picture. I said, I love mice picture. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, we went into that, and I think that sort of brings us up to where we are. Right now, things look very rosy. We have another picture with Stephen and George Lucas. And uh, that's what we're working on right now. After that, we have even another picture of which is being written right now. Um, there's a writer named Robert Town. He wrote Chinatown, Personal Best, something called Grace Doke. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Robert Town has worked on a beautiful story uh, that we'll be doing in Ireland. Anyway, any other questions? Yeah, I did that. That was, we were in the middle of uh, Secret of at that point. We got that opportunity. It paid about $300,000. It was only going to be, I think, two minutes long. Well, that's the best part of the movie. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> I was terribly disappointed in that movie. But I, I had, a, I had a, a wonderful experience I'll share with you about that. And that is, we worked very hard on it. It took us 11 weeks to do the entire thing from beginning to end. We worked in my garage and in my bedroom to actually you know, do that. We moved out of the studio, just a few of us, and took a break or a hiatus from doing uh, Secret and M. Finished it, got it on film, they put it in the movie, and I hadn't seen it within the film or how it worked. So we all went running over to the opening night at the Plitt Theater, and there was all this audience. And I looked out over the audience, and here were all of these teenagers, you know, who were just very hip. <laughs> and I, you know, they have all these punk hairdos, and they're looking at this, and I thought, what? I, this is terrible. And I actually was so frightened, I got stage fright. Now, they didn't know who I am. 
I'm sitting there in that audience and my heart began to pound like I was going to die. And I knew the part that was coming from the movie and this was just a boom, boom, boom. And then when it came on screen and it started going, I thought I was going to die. I got stage fright that badly. So it was a, it was a very, it, it, I hadn't realized that I would feel that exposed. It was like an actor who was trying to go out on stage. Um, at first, it was a strange reaction with these kids, too. They went, what? You know, there was just all this thing going on, and then I did die. I was on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> and then they quieted down, and they watched, and at the end of it, there was a modest, meek little applause, you know, something like that. So I left the theater that night, and I thought, oh, Don, you're an idiot. What are you doing? <laughs> so it was, it was an interesting experience, but I've had many letters since that, that tell me that people liked it. So <coughs> nice still animated campaign. Yes? What are your views of computer animation? I love it. <laughs> computer animation to me is like another kind of paintbrush. You know, and it's a, it's a tool that can be used, and it will be used very much more than it is right now when it's less expensive. It costs more than cello right now, and that's regrettable, and I think it will come down. So far, it's been able to accomplish a lot of uh, inanimate object work. Tron was filled with, I think, a great demonstration of what it can do. Um, what I'm hoping is somewhere we can get into personalities with it, and I've seen some of that in Bob Abel's work. Have you seen John Ross Yes. Yes. That's getting me. Yeah. It takes a little while, and I think it's going to get there. So um, it's just a great paintbrush. Any other? Yes. Why did we decide to go to Ireland? Whenever you ask a person the, the reason why, you can generally put money in. <laughs> okay. In this case, it had a lot to do with money. It was really a twofold answer. I'm not that cynical, really. Um, we went there because, or are going there, we're moving on the 25th of this month, and we're moving 80 of our people over there, including your seven dwarfs. We're all going there. <laughs> and we're going there because the Irish government is very protective. They're very much uh, going to help us with equipment financially. They're going to help us with grants for all the people that we might hire over there so that we can build a company and not just a picture. When you build a company, I mean, what it represents to us is probably six million dollars. When you build a company, you do realize that you live to fight another day. And so it means to us that we have a future and we can protect those people that have the talent. So it's there to protect the talent. What we then are going to do is start a school of animation which will be open to all of the European talent or American or Canadian talent, which will try and attract talent from all over Europe um, to come there and get involved and provide work is the idea. Because if you have schools and the schools train you and you actually develop yourself to do this kind of thing, and then when you get out of school and you say, well, now what will I do for a living? It's not very satisfying. You know, you want to have a place to go work. So we need to have more pictures. So we, we're going there for two reasons. Find talent and to get money. Yeah. Uh, does that mean that you're expanding all over Europe as well? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Not just in Ireland, but also in Spain. We're, we're looking into Spain, Czechoslovakia, London, you know, all throughout Europe, France. There's a lot of people that we're already in correspondence with who have sent portfolios. And uh, we're looking at them and trying to figure out how to fit them into some kind of a program. There is a tremendous market, I feel, right now in family entertainment through the video cassettes going into the home that hasn't really been opened very much. And things could be produced like music videos, animated, and a combination with live action that could go easily, easily into the homes and could earn money. So that's something we plan to explore. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm going to ask this at the risk of sounding cynical, but do you think that um, it's going to be possible uh, soon uh, to do a uh, classical feature that uh, can uh, divorce itself from the slightly saccharine Disney feel? It can. Do you know what? We're, we're pandering slightly. Did everyone hear the question? We're, we're pandering slightly to an audience. 
I think that, you know, this is like if I were going to swim from Santa Monica to Catalina, I don't want to have them drop me from the helicopter in the center. <laughs> so what I really want to do is I want to get in the water, I want to feel the temperature, I want to try and see if I can, you know, swim. And I gradually will move my way there. So what it is is feeling your way towards that audience. If you're going to spend $12 million, which we are on our next picture, then I want to be sure that I can get the $12 million back because all it's going to take is a, a misjudgment and you're going to go off the road. And you can't make a misjudgment. If we were to do that, I mean, there are casualties all over. There's carcasses all beside the cinematic road that said we shouldn't have made that movie. And you can name those movies yourself. I don't have to. They shouldn't have made it. So uh, I think to answer your question is it would be nice to do that. I would love to be able to make a movie that dealt with something that was a more serious nature. But I have to keep making movies that are commercially successful. You know, and gradually. There, this is a good analogy, I think, that might fit this too. When I was a kid, my job was to feed the calves that we were weaning from the cows. And so I would get the bucket of milk, go out to the calf, and I'd say, okay, here we go. You're going to drink the bucket. You're going to drink the milk in this bucket. And then the calf would look at me. Okay. So the way that we do it is I would put my hand in the bucket and get some milk on my hand and put it in his mouth. And then he would begin to suck on my hand and I would carefully beat my hand down into the bucket. <laughs> and then he would begin sucking the milk in the bucket and I would carefully remove my hand from his mouth. <laughs> as soon as I got my hand up in the air, up would come his head. <laughs> And so we'd try it again until he got the hint that the milk was in the bucket, not in my hand. So that, that weaning thing is something that I've always thought of that example when I hear a question like that because it's a slow process. You know, change happens slowly. Where is that thing? Dublin. Dublin? I don't know. There are those who do. It's, uh, it's across from Phoenix Park, and it's called the Phoenix House. Uh, Phoenix Park is the largest park in Europe. It's a great big zoological place and uh, very, very nice. We have a five-story building, 38,000 square feet, bigger than we've ever had. You know, and it's just a tremendously, it's a difficult move to. Everybody has to pull the roots up, take all of their animals, and get new places to stay, and breathe new air, and it's real tough. But I think it's a physics requirement. Yes, sir. Um, is this the first movie you made with um, Steven Spielberg? Like, okay, did he do um, Greatest of Love? No, he did. Okay. Um, okay. Um, okay. What, what I thought was good movie, right? Here in Philly, was the part of like, I mean, here's the wild end, right? Playing it down. So, so he goes down and with the cockroaches are there. Mm -hmm. Like, they look pretty ferocious things. Like uh, I thought that was uh, one of the strong points of the film, right? Because it, it was scary or anything. Now, I have to tell you that that was me anticipating Stephen. <laughs> I said, what would Stephen like to see if we went into the steward? Stephen would like to see bugs, cockroaches, vermin, things attacking, you know, horribleness. And we, so we even put a sewer slug in there eating those things. I thought, he'll like this. It was on the first end of the first part of the picture, so when I took the stories boards back to him, he just got electric and said, Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> and he was really enjoying that. And I thought, ah, I got him. I know how to I know how to get something okay. And then of course in subsequent meetings after that I thought I was, you know, making the point and oftentimes I didn't. Because I, I couldn't always guess him. Because he would always like the little hat example. He would think way around my brain. He's very bright now. Yes, back I there. I have to ask you, uh, whose idea was the water giant? Yes. And, uh, how did you see it working in the story? Did you originally see it as, as part of, as a character, or was it just something that was supposed to be an elemental or something? No, it was, it was supposed to be a Rorschach in the water, not a beast that lived in the water, but the water. And we had lots of battles about that all the way through because I kept making it too realistic and he kept wanting it to be just sort of there and hinted at. And I said, well, unless I draw something there, I'm not sure that anyone will know what is there. And so uh, it was never Rorschach-y enough for him. And part of the 
problem, I guess, we had with that is we actually took a swimmer and went out and photographed all that stuff. So that person was, that was a person that did all that. And we used that person's movement to help us get there. I mean, I have a lot to do with that. Yeah. Yes? If there's anything that you would see as a common thread with new students coming into your school that you have to either break their training or do something with them that might be a common thing, what would that be? New people that come in from out of school and you have to retrain them in any way to, to work with your uh, system. Bad habits. Um, I would think if there's anything that might be is, is pliability. Uh, learn to adapt to whatever the needs of the picture are. <clears throat> when you go to a, when you go to a studio to work, depending on what kind of animation you're working in, if it's any of the kinds, and maybe some of you will be the ones who will who will give category names to what animation is. You might just try to sometimes sit down and think up different category names and talk to them on yourself. Find out if you can give this thing. A form. You know, what what is animation? Define it for us. It may be right here in this room that you'll come up with it. I haven't done very well at it. But I would think that whoever you go to work for, uh, you're going to try and hook in as quickly as you can with what it is they're trying to build. In the case of our studio, we're, we're making features, and so what you have to do is you have to say, how can I get with the program as quickly as possible? How can I make myself available to what they're trying to do? It would be similar to going to sea with a captain and a crew and trying to, you know, sail to Hawaii. You don't want to be rebellious. You don't want to be too forceful. You want to be creative. You want to be helpful. Like I said again, one of the fantastic things about seven people that came from here is that they're just terrifically pliable. They're nice people. They have a, a structured morality, if you will. I don't know where they got that. And um, it's fun to be around them. Very, very fun. Manners. They have manners. <laughs> I thought manners, you know, disappeared. Thank you. They say thank you. They say please. You know, there's a lot of things that are of value to me. And uh, these people do that. And it doesn't go unnoticed. No, I put them, there always is that period of getting acquainted. Like if one of you, let's say you came down to the studio and you said, okay, I'm going to work, and we look at your portfolio and we say, what have we got here? Well, we have... We have the Boston Strangler problem, you know. <laughs> you know, Jack the Ripper. I don't know what we got. So we said we have to have a period of getting to know each other. And those are the humiliating periods for you. Because we say we're going to take eight weeks and we're gonna say, let us get to know you. Four weeks we'll tell you whether we really like you or whether you want to be nice. And in eight weeks we'll say we'll make a commitment. So we get used to you and find out if you get along with everybody. We find out if your talent is there. And during that period of time, which is something we've set up, we get to know you. And if we like what we see and it looks like the tile's good, then we'll start throwing as many medicine balls as you as, as we can. And then see if you can stand up. So I'll throw bigger and bigger challenges. And the bigger the challenge and the more you can stand up, the bigger medicine ball you're gonna get. And if you could skip everything and go right to director, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, we need directors. We need people that can, can do it. But a director, you know what a director does? He's a psychologist. <laughs> and he has to sit. I spend most of my day, I, don't, I draw in the early morning because I have to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning to get there at work and work for two hours before the cattle drive begins. <laughs> okay? So there's two hours that I get the storyboarding done in the wee hours of the morning. And it starts then... <clears throat> At 8 o'clock. I don't get there till 6, but I get up at 4 and try and wake me up. <laughs> but I get there at 6, work from 6 to 8, and at 8 o'clock they walk in. And when they walk in, they arrive with their violins, place them under their hands, and begin to play their sad songs. Okay? <laughs> and they all have one about how somebody is not helping them correctly, and they want to animate, and you don't understand the sacrifices I'm making, and I come all the way in there. <laughs> 
I listen to that, and I try to be compassionate and be understanding, and if I ever tell them what I'm telling you right now, you say, you must say that to me when I'm here. <laughs> but uh, you have a lot of that kind of thing to do. And all day long, there must be 10, 12 of those sessions, which could last as long as 20 minutes. When do you make the picture? <laughs> and then you, you go around and, and you check with all the departments to be sure that the background department is painting the same picture we're making. <laughs> <laughs> because they, they get into their music and their little headset and they're off their painting and suddenly it's, no, 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 John, this was supposed to be a red scene, you know, really. and the layouts, the same problem, they're drawing the wrong trees, so you have to go check all the departments to make sure all that happens. So what you're doing basically is you're curving this whole thing together that keeps wanting to fall apart, and it keeps wanting to push itself apart because they're egos. And so you hold together, that's what the director's trying to do. Hold together and hang on for two years. Don't let it fly apart. And if anybody is a rotten apple and is trying to make it fly apart, send them on a picnic for a while and then let them come back when they feel better. So that's the job. What, what you see on the screen when you see American Tale is <clears throat> reflections of light on a screen, and that's terrific, and I love all that. But what went on to get that on the screen is much bigger, and it's much harder, and that's where all the fun is. So there's a, there's a lot more you know, to it, but getting to know the person is a great part of it. And it, eventually, you know, it works out. We get to know them. So what do you look for in a portfolio, then? A person that can communicate with a pencil, you have to draw. Um, you can tell by, by the drawings of a person if they're free or not. A lot of psychologists say that you can tell, just like a, just like a Rorschach test, you know, you can tell whether a person is all gummed up inside. He needs to go to a lot more theater. Because their drawings will be tiny. Some people, when they write, you know, they're, they're writing, I, I'm stepping on very long toes here, I know, but the writing will be tiny and small and everything, which means that they're controlling everything. They're not looking at the world. They're not free. So you have to, you have to keep these emotions flowing out of you so that you feel good about yourself, feel free. The thing that I, I believe that almost every human being craves more than anything, what is it? Don't, don't say sex. <laughs> What do you crave more than anything? <laughs> That's part of it. To work in your studio. That's like sex, but what is it? That's a bigger word, actually. Appreciation. Liberty. <clears throat> freedom. You want to be free of okay. sickness, death, the earth. You don't like gravity. You want to fly. You want to be free of everything that's holding you down, free of the mask that you're forced to wear, free of the oppression and the guilt put on you by your families and your friends, free of all those things that keep you from expressing your joy, expressing what you feel, art, expressing your art. You want freedom. And that's the thing that drives you crazy because you can't get it. That's why at the American Tale, at the end of it, what are we expressing with Bible? He's free finally. He's free when he grabs Papa and we put him in the water to have that scene. Because water represents birth, it represents life, it represents uh, cleansing. You know, and they all get in the water, splash around, and here we are. And then after they're in the water through a bad transition, we go into the air. <laughs> when you get in the air and you're, and you're no longer tied to the earth and you're on a pigeon and you're flying around, you're free. <coughs> and you're just soaring. So again, you know, freedom, and, and you feel that exhilaration. That's exciting to feel. Didn't you ever think of this when I was a kid? I used to just dream about having a set of wings under my bed, and I could put them on, and just go out and flap and fly. Did any of you have that? <laughs> what in the world? Are you, what is wrong with you? <laughs> But to, and, on, and on the evening nights, you know, when I was, I herded a lot of cows, and I don't know why I did that, but I herded cows on a gym. And I would take them down the lane so that they could eat their food and then herd them back so that they could sleep. And as I would go down there in the evenings, then you would, I could see the, uh, the little uh, 
butterflies that were there. And I could see and I could smell the air. I could smell the grass and the sun was setting everything. It was so beautiful and so romantic and so lovely. All I could tell is I want to fly over the top of this. I want to soar over the top of it. That's a feeling. It's an emotion. And everybody feels that. I've tested them. I've tried that. And that's what they want to do. Get off this earth. Eventually you'll get off. <laughs> They'll leave your husk here and you'll get off. Any more questions? Yes. Yeah, I was wondering what your opinion is of uh, old Saturday morning cartoon. <laughs> <laughs> Saturday morning is a living. I worked in it for three years. And I worked on Archie and his friends, Sabrina, <laughs> the groovy Gooby. <laughs> the things of that. I know it very well, and I know what it's trying to do. Now, on a on one level, it provides it provides a living. And it's something that you can go do and you can always earn money at. It's a trap. Because once you get in there and you start tasting the wine, talking about the big money, you start tasting that wine, you may not be able to get back out. And if you go in there and get stuck in there like a fly in a, in a Venus flytrap, you may wind up hating what you do, thus hating yourself. You don't want to wind up there. If you go into Saturday morning to earn money, remember that maybe it's temporary. Go do that and earn a little bit of money, maybe learn what it's like, but hitch your wagon to a star, not a mud puddle. See if maybe that won't help you. Now, maybe you like Saturday morning. Maybe you like those characters. Maybe it's your cup of tea. That is okay also. One of the things that that I try and remind myself of, and I'm just a you know a silly idealist, <coughs> is that is Saturday morning has lost some of its integrity, if it ever had any. And <laughs> That is that it, uh, it is trying to sell a product. It's trying to sell either dolls, toys, sugar. You know, so it's out there marketing something that isn't animation. It's, it's a billboard or a commercial for another product. Now, I don't think anyone will deny that. That is what it's doing. But maybe in the process you can entertain. Uh, you do have network executives that are trying to entertain and trying to guide that in the right direction, but sometimes it's hard. If you can do something better, I recommend it. If that is what is open to you and you can get jobs in it, do it and uh, make it only a stepping, a stepping stone to something better. You're worthy of more. Give yourself more. And what I'm hoping is that somewhere, uh, somebody will say that the children of the world deserve better. Now let me get a little pomp here for a second. Okay? This is pompous, but I don't think it's innocent entirely that you, you let the kids sit there and just watch this. Because what you put into the children's heads, they will grow up to be. And by, by, by putting things into their heads and giving them ideas or giving them senses of morality, whatever that morality may be that's on Saturday morning, that's really an investment in our future. The children are the future. So you want to be sure that if you're part of that and you're helping form the future, then do the best job you can. And that doesn't just mean how the characters move. It has to do with content. You know, so that's what I'll have to say. Yes? Nevada has had a lot of ups and downs. Um, the last time that I saw Nelvana, when was it? Rock and Rule, I saw that, which I thought was very well done. The story was weak for me, but I'm not one to talk about weak stories. But, um, I think they haven't quite located themselves yet as to exactly what it is they want to do. They want to stay in business, so that causes people to do strange things. I mean, I had a hard time doing the video games. I didn't feel good inside myself with those games. We were doing an arcade market, and I didn't, and I justified those things through all the publicity, like, you know, right through the teeth. <laughs> this is terrific because it helps kids get eye hand coordination. <laughs>
but there's nothing like the rich. The rich can always be principled. You know, they can afford to be. The rest of us have to work so hard. Yes? What are your impressions of the Canadian animation? What, what you saw? Like Canadian Fillboard? Yeah. Some of the things that's in there? I love those. Absolutely love those. I think they're so creative. And you guys up here are really, you're twice blessed because you have, uh, some of those are grants, are they not? Mm -hmm. Do those? Mm -hmm. Yeah, see, those are terrific. Because you've got, a, you've got a government who recognizes art as being necessary. Well, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> <laughs> well, come to my neighborhood. Arsene doesn't know we're here. Yes. Uh, what about Japanese animation? What do you think of that? Those are... Uh, there's some things that I've seen there that I, you know, they, they frighten me a little bit because they're way ahead of almost where, where we're heading right now. They're very, very good. Um, they, they don't tell the same story that Americans can understand because their, their society is so different. But their artwork, their perspective, their layouts, their paintings, their characters, and all of that is beautiful. Not all. It's hard to just generalize and say all Japanese animation is great. But I have seen some that is magnificently done. You know, they're so design oriented. And um, I don't know, they're just, it's fun to watch. I do enjoy it. It's usually full. Cool. Any more? Yes. <coughs> what, yeah. Other than being being nice and polite, what qualities do you think that our graduates and the faculty have that you're in the makeup maybe a little bit more unique or, or special to you as an enemy? What is the question? <laughs> <laughs> um, you said several times that, that um, our graduates working with you are, are very, uh, they're nice, they're polite, they're willing to do anything, but is there something that we're getting here at the college that is perhaps more, uh, more unique, that are training? Uh, I think it's a professionalism is what it is and they when they arrive there at our place at least the seven that I've worked with all of them have a, a passionate desire to do the very best that they can it's not always the case with people that I meet that say they want to go into animation many of them say yeah I want to be an animator but when it comes right down to it they aren't willing to sacrifice very much. They don't give very much. And when it comes to it also, you wind up doing a lot of the drawings for them. And you wind up, you know, helping them through their scene. And they don't really give it much thought. And so it's like, you know, baby feeding them all the way through it. Now these people that have come from here, I haven't had that problem. They go to their desk. They're there for almost 12 hours a day. They work really hard. And when they've got something that they really like themselves, they say, come and look at it. I think that's really nice, where I've had other people come to me and say, come and look at it, and it looks horrible, and the only reason they're asking me to come and look at it is to help them find it. See, so it's a real, real difference, and, and I think what's happened is, and I, I give it to your faculty here, there's something going on that is, I think, really terrific. We recognize that down there. I don't know what it is. It's got to do with the personalities of these gentlemen, and uh, I think Something nice has happened. So I don't know. But you're good kids. Any more? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, can you tell us the spells that you know for the top secret? Oh, no, I can't say that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's close. It's close. Have I bored you for too long? <laughs> oh. Stay awake. I think we actually, we, it's great. We've gone half an hour over time nearly, which is, I wish we had another hour, but I... Uh, three, three, yeah, minutes, three, three minutes. Three minutes. Okay. Three minutes, and that means maybe three questions. Yes. How do you feel about Disney? Would that be a good place to work, or do you feel Yes. 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 Yes, it would. Disney, uh, Disney has done a lot of recuperating right now, which they're trying hard to get their animation department on its feet. You know, and they have some very strong businessmen who know the economics that it has to pay. So besides being a good picture, it has to be a paying picture. Um, they're very fair, and I think right now they're trying harder than they've ever tried. It, it isn't quite the fantastic thing it was when Walt was alive. You know, it just can't be that. But it is a good place. You know, and they have the money. <laughs> Do you have any uh, ideas of your own for another feature film in the future? Do you think that this one 
introduced it into Indonesia. That's what Spielberg and Lucas and me have been talking about. Well, there is a there's a resurgence of interest in animation. If American Tale does well at the box office, it's it's undoubtedly going to cause raised eyebrows with money people. And now what I hope does not happen is I hope they don't rush in suddenly and there's a barrage of animated pictures produced that are bombs. And everybody then goes, aha, we just proved it again, it doesn't work. Don't want that to happen. But gradually, if I explain to you, what we need to do is get our feet in the water here and make every animated film that is made a success. So if Disney makes one, it's got to be a financial success. If somebody else makes one, if Nirvana makes one, a success. Don't you dare make a turkey. Okay? If, um, if uh, Spielberg and Disney decide to make this Roger Rabbit, Okay, a success, which I have no doubt it will be. What I've seen of it looks pretty good. So it has to work. And the public, when they go and see animation, have got to come out and say, I love animation. When's the next one coming? When? Do <laughs> <laughs> you realize, if you can get that to happen, then you can say, hey, you know what? I think I want to ask for a raise. <laughs> Right now, you can't ask for a raise, and any union that comes in and asks for one for you is out of order. Because all they do is just you know, they hurt everything. So that doesn't work. Give another question. We get one more. Free. Do you ever think the uh, so called golden years of animation would be sort of brought back or uh, sort of renaissance? Years. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's going to take a lot. Those were years, I think, where. It was pioneering, it was exploring, people were learning a lot. They were ferociously mean years. And I don't know whether we'll ever know the history of the Disney Studio. But I know a little of it. A little piece because I was there during one year when Walt was alive. And um, he was a kind man. He was a gentle soul. He was paternal. He was demanding. He was awesome. He was mean. Did you think of him as being mean? He was mean. And he scared the wits out of people who worked for him. And he frightened them to the point that many of them were driven to their graves. <laughs> How, what was going on? I'm talking about a very passionate thing that was going on there. I walked into one man's room at Disney Studio, and I'll share this with you. I mean, there's no reason to hide it. Walked into him, his name was Fred Kopetz, and he said, come here, I've been here for years and years. Don, I want to show you something. See this list? And he got this list out and began to read this list to me, and he said, these are all the people that I've known over the years, and who have all been alcoholics, and they've all died, and they've all just been scared to death of Walt and everything. And I said, oh, this is terrible. This is no <laughs> No, why? You Pinocchio, and you know, this is what made it. And I, you know, it, it was a dichotomy. And he said, you see this page? And he held up this one, filled with names. He says, these killed themselves. And I said, they were that unhappy? He says, oh, yes. He said, there was a bloodbath. Because the people were angry, they were frightened, they didn't know, you know, what they were trying to achieve. Walt was, he felt tortured because he was pushed away by a union. There was a lot of pushing and pulling that was going on there to create these pictures. They don't just happen. That golden age looks effortless, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Look at the bloody toe shoes. Because the ballerina that leaps around on the stage like you know, everything's fine. If you go off in the wings and look at her, she can't breathe. She's gasping like that, and her feet are bleeding, but you don't let that pain show, so it looks like, you know, it's all just happening, and everybody says, I'm going to take my kids, this is such a pretty little picture, but the picture has got something else going on backstage. So there is a lot of pain that went into doing it. If you would go into the same thing, the golden age of animation, there's going to be probably some pain there. How much pain you can stand to get it there, who knows? I personally have said to myself, it's not worth anybody killing themselves over. It's not worth it to me, and I don't want any of my employees driven that far, so I talk to them. I talk to them a lot, you know, and I listen to them, and I say, ah, oh, your elephant died. I am really sorry. <laughs> so, 
skills. The only way you can do that, you can't separate yourself from those employees. I get as close as I can to them and make sure that they know that I love them and that I will go to battle for them and I'll support them any way that I can, you know, to make things work for them. That's the only way I can be sure that that doesn't repeat itself. And then out of that irritating, I guess, competition that these people will have for themselves, that's how the, the pearl will happen. Okay, if there are no more questions, let me say that um, I won't get to know all of you people. I mean, there's not enough time and I'll go home again, but I've seen some of your faces and there's light in your eyes. And it's fun to look at you. You're very, very pretty. <laughs> I mean that sincerely, you are. And uh, so as you go throughout your lives and as you hunt for your dreams and everything, maybe our paths will cross again, maybe they won't. But I might see some of you do things and maybe we'll meet then. Do the best that you can to be the best that you can in whatever you do. Support your faculty here, build your school. And uh, you have a good reputation right now. Do people do talk about the Sheridan College? I don't believe you're aware of that. But they do talk about you. So you should feel very proud of that. You're a great group. I've enjoyed being here. And uh, I hope all goes well with you. Thank you.